Hello, and thank you for joining us for this OncLive Peer Exchange. The clinical presentation and the biology of neuroendocrine tumors varies widely and impacts both the prognosis and the management of this disease. More recently, evidence has emerged regarding additional benefits with somatostan analogs, with chemotherapy, uh, as well as with a number of new targeted treatment approaches. This OncLive peer exchange will focus on understanding the clinical and biological distinctions in neuroendocrine tumors, the symptom management, the role of surgery, and some of the latest research that is likely to impact clinical practice. My name is Dr. Matthew Kolke. I direct the program in neuroendocrine and carcinoid tumors at Dana-Farber Brigham and Women's Cancer Center. I'm also an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. I'm joined today by Dr. Jennifer Eads, who is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology and Oncology at University Hospital's Seidman Cancer Center, Case Western Reserve University, Case Comprehensive Cancer Center. I'm also joined by Dr. Eric Liu, who is a surgical oncologist at the Rocky Mountain Cancer Center, Dr. Diane Reedy Lagunas, an assistant attending physician at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and Dr. James Yao, who is professor and chair of gastrointestinal medical oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Thanks for participating in this discussion, and let's get started. So my first question is gonna to go to Dr. Yao. James, you've been in this field for a while, and when we first started treating neuroendocrine tumors, we thought they were all the same disease. I think that understanding has changed over the years. Um, in your perspective, how has our understanding changed? Well, that's a great question. As, as you mentioned uh, way back when, when we were early in this disease, we used terms like apodoma and uh, carcinoid tumor, atypical carcinoid, and thought of this as a pretty homogeneous but rare disease. But what we're understanding is when they're a little bit more common than we thought, and there's really a lot of a group, actually it's a group of different diseases that are in some way similar. Uh, we have known down now that uh, primary site makes a big difference in terms of prognosis as well as response to some types of treatment. And for example, we have diseases like gastric carcinoid and rectal carcinoid tumor, where most of the time they're localized, have great prognosis, they don't recur, but when they are actually uh, malignant, and when they do spread, they tend to have a very aggressive course. One of the, you know, one of the biggest differences is if you just take a step back and, and think about what are called carcinoid tumors and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, they look identical under the microscope, but they've responded really differently to treatments. Absolutely. You know, with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, they tend to be much more responsive to cytotoxic chemotherapy. Uh, we also have phase three data for VEGF inhibitors such as sunitinib, a trial that you, know, you were very involved in uh, developing, a drug you are very involved in developing. And uh, we also understand underlying some of these differences, uh, there are real differences in terms of the molecular biology. For example, in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, you see a lot of somatic mutations in the MEM1 gene. Uh, along with that, we also see mutation in DAX, uh, ATRX and the mTOR pathway. And along with that, we also understand that now they have a lot of recurrent chromosomal copy number changes. Uh, with small bowel carcinoid tumor, another large group, is actually quite different. We see very few uh, somatic uh, mutations that are recurrent. I mean, 10% with P27 involving the cell cycle. Uh, but generally, you know, on genomic sequencing level, they're pretty bland. We do have recurrent copy number variations and loss of you know, one copy of chromosome 18. And uh, the value of that uh, in terms of prognostic features is still an area under investigation. There are some hints that that may be a prognostic uh, marker in this group of patients. But as, as I think we move forward, we're gonna find more and more of these uh, you know, molecular differences that drives the bi biology and clinical course difference that we see. And I, would, I guess I would add to that too, James, is as you said, you know, we sort of have the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors that we say is a different entity, right? And then we have the so-called carcinoids. So we, we, for the last five to 10 years, have sort of lumped all, I guess, extra pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors into one lump sum of carcinoid. And as you're saying, um, that's probably not the right thing to do. And back in the olden days when we used to have the foregut, midgut, and hindgut, um, now as we're learning about the genetics, in fact, foregut may 
be different than the so-called mid-gut. So the lung, gastric, and pancreatic neuronal tumors may have common genetic findings as well as clinical findings, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting that we're sort of, in many ways, we're kind of going back to the old days nomenclature and thinking about genetically how these cancers may arise and um, not so necessarily lumping them together as all carcinoids.